this video, we're going to talk about solving convection problems using neutral number correlations. We saw from the basic form of the solutions to the governing equations that we expect for the Neusselt number to depend on the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number in a force convection problem. There are many correlations to look at, and let's talk now about some of the ways that we use them and some of the characteristics of those different correlations. So here's an example for the local Neusselt number on a laminar flat plate flow with a constant surface temperature. And we see that we have a correlation of the form some constant times Reynolds number to exponent times some, Pran some Prandtl number to an exponent, and there's a range of conditions over which uh, the Prandtl number must satisfy in order to use this equation. We can think about how what that means for the convection coefficient, calculate the average convection coefficient, and put that back into a Neusselt number relation to see the average Neusselt number anywhere from the leading edge up to a point x on a flat plate in a laminar flow with a constant surface temperature. Also see another one, also a function of the Reynolds, and Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, for now a turbulent flow over a flat plate with a constant surface temperature, and notice the constants changed quite a bit, and the exponent on the Reynolds number has changed, and also the conditions over which we use it. So if we think of over which, and also the conditions over which the correlation is valid. So when we use these correlations, we have to think both about those range of properties for which they're valid, those things that are expressed, and the conditions on the use of these, which relate uh, to the properties, Prandtl number, and also the flow conditions. So in order to illustrate that, I'm going to talk about this correlation for the Neusselt number for the flow over a circular cylinder in a cross flow. It's of course of the form, Reynolds, a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, and now we have a range of constants and exponents on the Reynolds number and the exponent on the Prandtl number, which I'm not mentioning on this slide, and possibly some additional things to it. Now remember the flow over a cylinder that we saw in the flow physics video that talks about the ranges, the different flow regimes that the cylinder goes through from a very low Reynolds number when we have creeping flow in an almost symmetric solution. As we increase the Reynolds number, we start to get a wake behind that cylinder, which is symmetric. As we increase it further, we start to see vortex shedding. The flow becomes unsteady and we get vortices shed from alternately from either side of the cylinder. As we increase it further, we start to get a laminar separation off the sphere and a turbulent wake behind it, and increasing it even further, we get a turbulent boundary there with a turbulent flow separation and a very different wake behavior. In all of those cases, the heat transfer characteristics are going to be quite different, and so you can see for this correlation, we have a range of Reynolds numbers that are specifying these constants to be used in there because it's a different flow regime for each and every one of these ranges. And it's very important that we capture that flow physics in order to get the respective heat transfer in that range. You'll also notice that there's a particular temperature at which you have to evaluate the properties. When you calculate a Reynolds number, you'll have to use a kinematic viscosity in order to calculate that, and of course the Prandtl number is a property uh, that you'll look up as well. And so this particular correlation is instructing you to evaluate all properties at T infinity except for PRS, which appears here, which is to be evaluated at the surface temperature. Clearly, the person that made this correlation found that it correlated the better data, the, correlated the data better if they added this term here, uh, accounting for the variations in the panel number. But you'll see different choices, and it's important to remember that this data is either correlated into an expression like this from experimental data, as it is in this case here, or it comes from some analytic solution and again is correlating the data from that analytic solution. The person that has done that has calculated properties in a certain way based on temperatures in a way that they've chosen to do it, and that is how the data came to be in this form. If you calculate your properties differently than they did, then of course your results won't match their results. So it's very important to follow their instructions and evaluate your properties the exact same way they did. Very often you'll find more than one correlation is a suitable choice for a given situation even within a given textbook, but certainly if you go to the range of textbooks and the broader heat transfer literature, you'll find many, many, many different choices for correlations. So this is an attempt to accumulate all of the results in the previous table for all the different flow regimes for a circular cylinder into a single and much more complicated uh, correlation, which captures that whole range. In that manipulation, we see that the constraint on using it has now been this combination of the Reynolds number time the Prandtl number being greater than or equal to about 0.2.
Now, it's much more complicated, but it is still a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. It has extra terms, and in this case, we are asked to evaluate the properties at the film temperature, which is a very common choice for evaluating temperatures in uh, forced convection heat transfer problems. Uh, and the film temperature is, of course, the average between the ambient temperature and the surface temperature, which is the average temperature that we'll see in our solution. So there are many different choices. You'll get slightly different answers. But let's bear in mind that all of these correlations are to engineering accuracy. They may be a much greater ac accuracy than is stated here, but you can expect to see in a, uncertainties as great as 25%. They're a wonderful way to start your calculation. They're a wonderful way to get a good estimate of the heat transfer, but expect that there is uncertainty in this. One of the reasons for that uncertainty, of course, is we're fitting data from perhaps a range of different properties and, and flow conditions, and we're getting a best fit that is the best fit over the range of it, but for any one given situation, of course, there's going to be some uncertainty. But mo in addition, most of our flow situations of engineering concern are turbulent flow situations, and turbulent flow solutions can vary quite a bit depending on, say, the free stream turbulence. If you imagine that cylinder flow, and imagine if there was a very large free stream turbulence coming in, we would be much more likely to have a turbulent boundary there, which would delay, or which would make the, the boundary there, <coughs> which might change the range of Reynolds numbers at which the boundary there separation moves further down the back side of the cylinder and decreases the size of that wick. So such things as the free stream turbulence can dramatically change our flow condition, which means that they can dramatically change our heat transfer results. And in some cases, that's simply what we have to expect is that there's going to be 25% uncertainty. If you use these correlations outside their intended range, the error can be much, much bigger than that. Perhaps there's another flow regime that has not been accounted for in coming up with a particular correlation. The heat transfer might be completely different, and so you should not use these correlations outside their intended range. You should keep searching to find one that is within their intended range, that has considered data for the flow conditions that you are speaking of. And don't ever forget that these results come about because of the interaction between the flow field and the heat transfer around these objects. If the flow physics changes, the heat transfer is going to change, and you'll have to be very careful and think about that. Make sure you find one that is reasonable to use. We may use many different correlations in our heat transfer problems. Uh, perhaps we have flat plates with different conditions. We may have cylinders that may have circular cross sections or otherwise. Perhaps we'll be looking at spheres. Tube banks are something that comes up a lot in heat exchangers when you have arrays of pipes that are arranged in certain conditions, perhaps staggered relative to one another. We may have impinging jets that are perhaps impinging on a surface in order to cool a surface that may be one jet or again arrays of jets. All of these things are going to change the fluid mechanics and the interaction of the fluid mechanics and the heat transfer around those surfaces and we'll need to find the correct correlation for our given problem. And of course there are many more possibilities available in the broader heat transfer literature.